Okay, good evening everyone. This is class six of our study of the book of Hebrews. We call it the book of better things because the word better is used about 13 times in this book, more than all the other books of the New Testament combined. It's the book of better promises, better priesthood, better covenant, and so on there. I have a name for this class called Jehovah Shammah. This is a title of God or of the city of God in the Old Testament. We're gonna look at that in a moment. But first of all, on the front of your notes there, we see a list of the names of Jesus that's found in the book of Hebrews. And I was really struck by how many titles, names, and very short little descriptions there are of Jesus in this book. And you see I count 60 there. And I've left off some because they were somewhat repetitive. But these are, these are names that describe Jesus as he is and as he relates to us in the church. And they are wonderful. As I wrote in my email regarding this class, if you study these names, it's really, you can almost get an epiphany. That means just get wowed by this and, and faith rising up that God is so wonderful to us. The word name in scripture we often hear is means a nature the person's nature is revealed by the name but it's actually more uh, uh, be better to say that it, it speaks of the revealed nature god has wonderful glorious but a multitude of unknown names his his depths can never be plunged and plumbed in full but through his word through the bible we he has decided to reveal aspects of his nature and those are the names that we find in scripture now there's a lot of names in the old testament i have a book here uh, called praying the names of god and these are a lot of the names of the old testament uh, especially but also some in the new but praying the names of god god has named himself many things in the old testament jehovah rapha the lord who heals you jehovah sidkenu the lord of our righteousness the Lord of hosts, um, Yahweh Sabaoth, and so on there. Those are wonderful names to learn. And this one right here is found in the very last verse of the book of Ezekiel. Very last verse, it's a long, long book, 48 chapters, I believe. And it reads uh, as, as thus. And then we'll get to these other names here. But go, if, you go to, if you have your Bibles and want to turn there to Ezekiel, the very last chapter, it's just before Daniel. And the previous seven chapters or so are a long description of, a, of the city of God as, he, as Ezekiel received it by vision. And the city of God is an amazing layout there, and, it, and it's, it's somewhat difficult reading. But it, nevertheless, it ends with these verses here, starting at verse 30. And these are the goings out of the city on the north side, 4,500 measures, and the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. The three gates northward, one gate for Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi, and then it goes on the other three sides there. And at the west side, look at verse 34 there, 4,500 with their three gates, the one gate of Gad, the one gate of Asher, the one gate of Naphtali, and it was round about 18,000 measures or cubits, and the name of that city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. In Hebrew, Yahweh Shama, or Jehovah Shama. Shama simply means he's there. And this is really the nature of the city of God, is that when you enter the city, he's there, and you're there. And he's love, and you're beloved, and you love him. And it's a city of worship and light. He's the, the lamb is the light thereof, and so on, as we see in the book of Revelation. Why would I bring up the city of God in a class on the book of Hebrews? Because in the book of Hebrews, three times we mentioned the city of God, two verses and a, and a longer passage, which we'll look at tonight. And the main reason is that this is the goal. This is the sixth class of our six, cla uh, six classes for this book. And really we have to consummate the study by looking at what is the ultimate goal that we have uh, as Christians and what was the goal that the author was trying to draw the, the, uh, the readers or listeners 
to this sermon. It's really a sermon long, uh, this book is. And what was he trying to do? Well, basically he was trying to attract them to the understanding of and the vision of the heavenly city to which we are ultimately designated or destined to enter in the name of the Lord and to dwell with him forever. So this Jehovah Shammah seemed like an appropriate name for this particular class. We're gonna be looking at that. But first of all, let's go to the names of Jesus in Hebrews, that first page again of your notes. And I highlighted some of the more prominent ones there. But just think about it. Just become enamored with the Lord through these things. I was thinking, I was driving here tonight and thinking about the, just the first verse of the 23rd Psalm. I said to myself, you know, if I just really believe the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want anything. I'm totally in his lap, so to speak. He cares for me. What, that's, about all, that's about the only name I need to have, in a sense. He cares for me like a shepherd cares for his sheep. Well, these are like that also. Look at these, these verses. I'll just look at some of them. I didn't put references there. You could look those up. But as I say, I just mainly, as I read through the book of Hebrews, studying, preparing for this class, I started to, uh, one of my programs was to underline the names and, and short descriptions of the Lord. And lo and behold, as I say, I came up with over 60 of these titles so, you know, he's the, the son, the son of God. He's the heir of all things. In other words, all things started with him. He's the alpha. <clears throat> all things are going to end in him. He's the omega. And that means he incorporates all us into that consummation that he has. He's the maker of the ages or of time or of the world, it says there. He's the brightness of the Father's glory, the express image of his person. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Everything is upheld by him. That's repeated in Colossians as well. And once he purged us of our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. It was a completed work. You don't sit down until you've finished your work. I come home, I sit down for dinner or whatever, but I sit down, it's done, the day's work is done, the Lord's work was done on Calvary when he said it's finished, it's raised from the dead, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. It is a complete work. He has a name that's more excellent than the angels. He's the first begotten. He loves righteousness and hates iniquity. He laid the foundation of the world. He made the heavens by his hands. I like number 19 there. He's the captain of our salvation. Uh, he, uh, well, let's go above that. He's, uh, who, he, number 16, he tasted death for me. In other words, I'm destined for death, but he tasted of death for me. And the last enemy that shall be conquered is death, according to 1 Corinthians 15. So he's he ultimately, we all say, well, we've got to die. But ultimately, he said he's going to conquer death. There will be, his people will never die. Um, he's... He's the one for whom are all things and by whom are all things. If you just get the grandeur of this name, of this nature of God that he's revealed to us. Number 25, he's the apostle and high priest of our confession. In other words, we confess and, and profess that he is the one who was sent, the apostle by the Father, and who has become our high priest, both the priest and the victim for our sins. Uh, he is the living God. That's repeated two or three times in the book. He's the great high priest who has passed into the heavens and opened a way for us to enter into the presence of God as well. Number 31, I like also, he cannot, he is the one who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. When we say, where are you, Lord? What's happened? He understands exactly. He was in all points this is uh, 2.18. He was in all points tempted like as we, but without sin. And he's able to, remember the word succor in the King James means to run to the cry of. If we cry to him, he runs to us in our need. And he's the author of eternal salvation. He's the forerunner. A forerunner goes before the rest. He is the one who, who went before us, but expects us to follow. Where he went, he wants us to go. And he went to the right hand of the Father. He is the one who exalts in the Father's presence and wants us to join the dance of the Trinity in sweet fellowship. He is the surety of a better testament. 
He's the assurance of it. You know, the book of Proverbs warns against becoming a surety. Anybody know what a surety is? It means you've promised if someone, if you're promising for someone else if, if they fail to pay a debt, you'll pay it for them. Okay, well, Jesus became the surety. You know, we have no means to pay our debt, right? And he became the surety for our sins and debts and trespasses. Um, he, and one number 40 there, he ever lives to make intercession for them that come unto God by Jesus. He's a, a, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. And there's a number of things we didn't cover in this class because we had so uh, just a short period of time. We didn't cover the tabernacle. We didn't cover the Melchizedek priesthood and other aspects of his ministry. But you can see that that's, he is the minister of the sanctuary for us. He's the mediator of a better covenant or the New Testament. He is the new, he has, is a new and living way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is that new and living way. And in talking about the city, he's the builder and the maker of the heavenly city. He's also, and I like this, the Alpha and Omega, the author and finisher of our faith. He began it and he's going to finish it. What is the verse that talks about that says the same thing? He who began a good work in you will do what? will end it to the glory of God. And of course, the familiar, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And of course, at the end, he's called the great shepherd of the sheep. So Jesus is given a shepherd's title three times in the New Testament, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, and the high shepherd, or excuse me, the good shepherd. And it ends with Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And so we, we looked at last week, talking about this goal of the heavenly city. We looked at last week, Hebrews 11 and 11, chapter 11, verse one, which says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or proof of things not seen. And we said that a lot of people, just to review a little bit, a lot of people study that verse, trying to get the key to personal faith for the things that they want. And we said this usually ends up, and I think very frequently ends up, it's not a magic key to faith, what it is, is um, because the words are very obtuse or uh, difficult to understand sometimes or see how they apply. What that verse is really saying is that faith is the substance of the things hoped for, which have been presented to you, Hebrews, <laughs> in this book, which should have excited you, given you a living hope, a panting, so to speak, a longing to see fulfilled. And so faith is something that grips you of the vision of the ultimate hope. And now we're going to talk about the city of God that we're to call it to. Is that which possesses you with such a dynamic desire that it becomes, as it were, substance. It becomes the, the very thing that you live and breathe for. The evidence of the things not seen. The proof of it as evidenced by your faith by your panting for it, by your praying for it. And then it goes through all that, many, many examples of people who got the vision in the Old Testament, sought it, died without achieving it because it says they will not be made perfect without us in the New Testament. And so they're after this with all of their heart and soul and mind and strength and emotions. And so one of those things is if we turn, if you have your Bibles there, in Hebrews chapter 11, one of those things, which we don't read about explicitly in the, New, in the Old Testament, is Abraham, where it says, if I get to chapter 11 here, that Abraham saw a city. Um, and it says, uh, verse, uh, verse 16, I think also in verse 10, was it? Yeah, verse 10, it talks about Abraham. For he, Abraham, looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And verse 16, now, uh, but now these, actually this is the seed of Abraham and Sarah, these, they desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. See, this is the ultimate goal. We talked about three wonderful goals in this book, dominion, again, Psalm 8, uh, regaining dominion over the earth, the original mandate to Adam in Genesis 1. Uh, also, the, uh, the city here 
and the priesthood that we're to have in him as well. So this is something that is, uh, we're, we're really seeking after uh, with all of our heart, and it should grip us just as it did all of these saints that could not possess it because the opportunity is now with us in the new covenant to actually enter into it, and they are following in as well. So let's look at, uh, let's look at some things about this city because the city is described, as we said, in Ezekiel. It's also described in the book of Revelation. Here's some of the verses that are found in the book of Revelation with regard to this city. Um, John writing, this is Revelation 21, 10 and 11. The angel carried me, John, away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Now the city of God is always pictured in the Old Testament and the New to a, as being on a high mountain. Why? Because a high mountain is just that. It's above everything that's around it. And it's a mighty thing. Uh, strong and powerful. He showed me the great city, the new holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And uh, verses 25 and 26, the gates of it shall never be shut by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring their glory and honor of the nations into it. Uh, back to verses... Uh, uh, over to chapter 21, uh, verse yeah, 12. And this city had a great wall, a wall great and high, and had 12 gates, and the gates 12 angels and names written thereof, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates, and so forth, all three directions. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he measured, this is verse uh, I can't remember the 17. He measured the wall thereof 144 cubits according to the measure of man that is of the angel. A lot of symbolism in this. If the foundation of the wall is the apostles of the Lamb, what he's saying there is that the, the, um, what, what makes this city is the word that went forth from the apostles of the Lamb. If you read John 17, Jesus is especially addressing his great high priestly prayer that his disciples, his apostles, would accurately preach the word of God because everything would be built upon what they preached, okay? What they wrote about him in the gospels and then when they wrote their epistles, everything they said had to be perfect. And so this city is perfect because its walls, the foundation of them is based upon the word of the apostles. And then the, the 12 gates have the names of the children of Israel upon them. If you're going to enter in, you must be a Jew. Oh my goodness, that leaves me out. No, those, what does Paul say in Romans? He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but what? One who is one inwardly. So we must be of Israel coming in. Also says that the gates are gates of pearl. What's, that pearl is the only jewel or gem that is derived from a living organism. And how is it created? through suffering, right? The sand goes into the oyster and the oyster coats it with nacre, I think it's called, and, and it grows and grows. But it's something that is called, through suffering, a gem is created. If we're, and those gates are of pearl, means we, through our experiences, our falls and rises, and our trusting in the, and the faithfulness of the Lord, that allows us to enter into the holy city. Again, we're not getting yet to the book of Hebrews so much here, except, to just give you a background of what we're looking at and what they were looking for. If you turn to your outline there, if you have it in front of you, I'll try not to, uh, we're not gonna be reading everything there. In fact, the first page I'm not going to review um, there, except that we're gonna go, be going into chapter 12 there, uh, which consists of four main parts. Um, as I say there, exhortations, um, looking at Jesus, not being discouraged because of God's dealings with us, and then keeping on watch over others lest they too fall from this. Now this is where I'd like you to have your Bibles open to chapter 12, and we're gonna go through this verse by verse quickly, uh, all the way from the first verse down to the verse 22, which starts the description of the heavenly city and what our inheritance is there. Okay, I'm reading again from the King James with little comments along the way. Everybody there, chapter 12, verse 1 of Hebrews. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so there's a lot in this verse. First of all, the great cloud of witnesses is, this is the first verse of chapter 12, which means it's going to back and referring to all of those saints, the heroes of faith in chapter 11, a multitude of them that are, that are described. And they are a cloud of witnesses. They, are a wit they witnessed of the Lord, and he's saying now in heaven they're witnessing <laughs> from the place of the Lord in that city. They're, they're watching us as well. And they're being used as, you might say, on the other side of the veil, they're being used of God for the, the consummation of the, of the age as well as to witness of him in the word of God. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily, the better translation here is entangle us or trip us up. What are the things that entangle us in the things of the world. I think they're described in the parable of the sower, you know, the cares of this world, the excitement, um, the desire for riches, the persecutions and things that arise. Let's lay aside everything we can that entangles us in the world and then run with patience uh, the race that is set before us. So he says in other epistles, the Corinthians and so on, that we are in a race for the goal of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so we run that race, but he says do it with patience. Um, patience is what that was, that was a, whole, a, whole, a whole subject last week as well. Impatience, we said, is one of our great enemies. And I, I was wondering, there was one quote, I, I got various quotes on impatience, and there was one, I can't remember the, who, who first said it, but it was a very simple line, but it really struck me. It said, I have never seen a happy, impatient person. <laughs> when, I, when I read that, I said, ouch, <laughs> that is really true. I, when I'm impatient, I'm not happy. And when I'm not happy, it's probably because I'm really impatient with somebody or something like a computer, okay, or something like that, all right? So it's, that's true. Run with patience because the good shepherd knows you. You need not want. He's in charge. And if you call to him, he runs to your help. He may not run the way you think he should run because he's a good father who's teaching us things and teaching us to overcome our impatience sometimes by trusting that he has these things in hand. In the sermon, uh, excuse me, the parable of the sower, one of the lines there says, these, these sown on the good soil, remember it was, it was sown on the pathway, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, and the good soil, the seed was sown in, and it's the word of God. It's those sown on the good soil are those who hearing, uh, hearing the word, Hold it fast. And that's what I'm talking about. Faith is substance of things hoped for. They held it fast. The vision wouldn't let them go, and they wouldn't let the vision go. Those on the good soil hear it. They hold it fast. And then it says, And, and an honest and good heart bear fruit with patience. Okay? And that's two last words and the important one. You bear fruit with patience. You can't see an apple ripen just by looking at it and waiting for it. Come on, hurry up. It's going to ripen when it ripens. And your maturity, the fruit of the Spirit, is going to ripen when it ripens also, as long as we're being faithful and diligent, seeking his face and, and walking honestly with a good heart, as it said there. Um, chapter 10, verse 31, 36 says, For ye... Hebrews, have need of patience that after he have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Basically says the same thing there. Look, uh, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We saw that in chapter 1 as well. Because of the joy set before him, he despised the shame. He didn't count it something that would hinder him from the Father's will. Um, looking unto is an interesting expression in the Greek. It, looking unto literally means looking away from and unto. Okay, it's the same thing. 
Jesus looked away from everything that attractions of the world, whatever ploys and blandishments Satan could give to him, don't go through with this. But he looked away from it and turned to the cross and said, no, I'm come to do your will, Lord Jesus, or the Father, I'm sorry. And number three, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your it says minds, but souls is a better translation there. And the word consider again is interesting. Ana logisomai means, ana means back again. Logisomai means to reason. He said, consider him. In other words, don't just glance, reason about it. Go back and think about it again. Get the revelation of what he did for you. And the contradiction of sinners, that's, that, that was the, the cursing and the mocking that they gave to him, contradiction, antologia, the word spoken against him. Don't be weary, don't faint, because, chapter, verse 4, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Uh, again, you have not, the word there, unto agonizomai, we get the word agony from that, okay? The agon there, it's a wrestling match, it's a it's a, a striving, it's agonizing to achieve something there. Ye have not agonized uh, to get to see the will of God like the heroes of faith in chapter 11, agonized, praying to, to bring to pass the will of God or the, the vision of God, the city of God there. Striving against sin. Um, you have resisted unto blood at the, as far as the shedding of your blood, like that of the Messiah, he's basically saying there. Have you, he was willing to shed his blood. Are you agonizing to that extent as well? And verse six, and ha ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Okay, my son. Again, the father loves us and he calls us his children. The word chastening is an interesting word, and it's the word paideia here. Paideia in the Greek. Lots of books have been written about the Greek idea of paideia or paideia. Yeah, paideia. Paideia is a word that really was, we, it's just translated chastening here, but in the Greek view of paideia was this is the the whole training and discipline of a child to bring him up to mature manhood. Okay, and so this is what God is doing. He's not chastening us. And I'll just make you suffer a little, see if you can bear it. No, he's, he's doing whatever it takes to bring us up to the maturity that he wants us to have. The, and that maturity, by the way, is Ephesians 4.12, I think it is, bringing us to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And he wants us to come to, to a pretty high degree of maturity, right? And the Paideia, this, this, this bringing this bringing a child up to the maturity that he was designed to come up to, where he's a credit to the family name, was done. The father, assuming he's a well done, a well known, I'm just going to mean well off citizen, he would he would hire a paideus, a paideus. The paideus was designed to exercise to bring the the paideia onto the child's life. The father basically said to the paideus. Ideas, I want my son to be a credit to my name. If you have to break every bone in his body, I don't care what you have to do. Make sure we'd say it in the in, make sure he does his homework. Make sure he's training in the in the athletics. Make sure that he reads. Make sure he's memorized Homer. Whatever it takes to make him a credit to the society, to the polis, to the city, and a credit to my family name. In other words, the Paideus had a big job, and he exercised the rod. Whenever he had to, he'd, he'd do whatever it took because he knew that his neck, so to speak, was on the line with the master of the house. He was usually a slave, but he was an educated slave, and he had in charge of the child, and he made sure that that child did his homework, did whatever he needed to do to, ma to mature, and the father and the mother would be proud of him as he, as he did mature. Well, that's what the father, our heavenly father, is doing too. He does chasten us. He does let us go, uh, uh, to the, takes us to the woodshed occasionally. He does those things in order to make sure that we 
get away from, sheer away from those things that are, that are distracting us from the call that he has for us. So despise not the paideia, the chastening, the education that the Lord has for you, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Um, rebuke, by the way, is the same word as evidence, and faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evidence means that which is made manifest, that which is clear and is brought forth to the light. And so he says, when you are, uh, when thou art, when, when he brings forth the evidence of your wrongdoing and you're convicted in your conscience, don't, don't shy away, don't make excuses, say, yes, you're right, right, Lord, I repent, I confess, forgive me. Verse uh, 6 there, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, Padea, and scourges every son whom he receives. Okay, that goes along with Revelation 3.19 that in the letter of the, to the church of Laodicea, the Lord says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Rebuke verbally, chastening physically by circumstances. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And when I taught that, that some months, many months ago there, and taught on that verse, remember, the word zealous, therefore, means boiling. All right? He wants us to be zealous. And he said, and right after that, it says, be zealous, therefore, and repent in that same letter. Verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Verse 8, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards or illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Uh, that's interesting. If you want to write in your margin, if you have a place there for it, these scriptures, this is the, the phrase father of spirits and similar verses are found in this verse here and also in verse number 16, 22 and in numbers 27, 16 and in Ecclesiastes 12, 7. God is the father of your spirit. And I'm not going to explore, take us down a pathway there um, because it's a, it would really take be quite a excursion, okay? But you are what does Paul says? Paul says that we are made up of spirit, soul, and body. Is that right? May, may you all be fully sanctified. May your spirit, soul, and body be found uh, without fault or blame before God is coming. So if He's the Father. God is spirit, according to John 4, right? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. He's the, he is spirit, like begets like. He's the father of your spirit. And this is very interesting, because then you can start to, to see, what is he doing with me? He's dealing with me as a father of my spirit. Then what is my soul and what is my body play a part of this and so on? And that's a kind of a, that's a long study and it's interesting, Pastor Jim at his last Wednesday class was bringing up the afterlife, okay? Because in Psalm 1, which he's going through, it says the wicked shall not stand in the judgment, nor, excuse me, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the uh, assembly of the righteous. In other words, he, he was asking the class, he said, where do you think these people go if they don't stand? What, what happens to them? And then he presented various options and said, bye, when the class ended and left every, everybody just <laughs> hanging there because... He didn't want, he just, he was, that wasn't the purpose of the class, but he wanted you to think about that. And so the same thing here, if he's the father of spirits, he's dealing with your spirit because he's your, the father of your spirit. And you are clothed with a soul and you're clothed with your body. But we'll, we won't pursue that any longer. But I, I suggest you look up those three scriptures I gave that will really help. Verse 10, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, our parents, but he for our profit that we might become, I like this, partakers or partners, partakers of his holiness. In other words, he wants to bring us up to the measure of his holiness, partaking of his holiness, partaking. It doesn't, you see that it's not the law that's being given there. It's he wants us, he wants to impart to us his holiness, the zeal for the Father's will to do, so that we are sharing in that holiness. It's not a matter of, you'd better be holy, because I'm not going to accept you if you're not. It's, 
He wants us to view the vision or grasp the glory of his holiness and so he can embrace us into it. Want, we want what he has and become like him. Verse 11, no chastening for the present seems joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Uh, and I have here Isaiah 32, 17, the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of its way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fall, fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby, thereby many be defiled. Now here's, again, we've moved now from our personal walk and our zeal for the Lord, looking to Jesus. Now we're starting to look out to our brethren because I, am, I have a life with you. You have a life with me. We meet together. We care for one another. And if someone is, is, is falling away, is letting things slip, as uh, chapter 2 mentions there, then we want to be aware of that because it's going to affect the whole assembly. So looking out, looking diligently there, the first two words in the King James is episcopio, which means to scope out. Are you, you got a telescope looking at the brethren. Is everything okay? That guy looks really glum today. He, you know, this other one is just sort of sitting by himself by a corner. What's going on here? And so I'm scoping that out and I'm after him. Um, in the parable of the, uh, in Luke 15, the parable of the lost coin, the woman loses a coin and it falls in the cracks on the floor. The floor was, they think, stones and it had crevices and so on. It falls there, but she searches, takes a candle or a lamp, she searches and searches until she finds the coin, lifts it out of the crevice and rejoices that it's lifted up and put back and it's, it, it, scholars think it was probably a, a, a necklace or something that had 10 coins and she was lost one. Of course, it becomes worthless if you lose the one coin, right? So, so she was rejoicing on this and that's what we should do as well. If we find someone falling away, we go after him or her and we find out what can I do to help? Can I pray for you? Do you, is it money? What's happened? You know, whatever it might be. And so we want to lift the one that's in the crevice up, put it back in the, in the beautiful, beautiful jewelry that is the body of Christ there as well. Uh, yeah, don't let, don't let trouble come into the, into the body of Christ. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. This is the third great warning in Hebrews. It's chapter 6, verses 10, excuse me, chapter 6, chapter 10, and now here in chapter 12. Warnings. Esau was a child of Jacob. He was part of the family, just as all of us are part of the family of God. But he's warning here, the writer is warning us that part of the family can become profane or a fornicator and be disqualified from the high and holy calling of entering this city. And so that's why it's important for us to look out for, in love, the person that may be falling away. For ye know how that afterward, when Esau would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he now found no place of repentance though we sought it carefully with tears. Okay. So we don't want to have people uh, looking at us from the outside, seeing that we did make it into the city, but they had to be left behind because they wouldn't put forth, uh, because they became defiled with the things of the world. For ye are not come to the mount that might be touched and burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest for the, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words which voice they had heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded and if so much of as a beast touched the mountain it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said I, am, I exceedingly fear and quake. This is the law. This is the Mount Sinai uh, experience there where God is giving 10 commandments, okay, and telling the people, you must obey, and the people were responded, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, which of course they didn't, okay? So we've not come to the mountain of judgment, we've come to the mountain of grace, 
And then he describes the city. And here's what we have here. Now the next verses are, are the important ones here. Uh, if you turn to verse 22 of chapter 12, we'll read that. We have it here. But ye, by the way, there was one thing I wanted you to, to, to notice here, the word ye. <laughs> I mean, he's, pointing, he's pointing his finger at him. Look at um, um, verse 4. I'll just say, ye have not resisted in the blood. Ye have forgotten. If ye endure uh, chastening uh, uh, and so forth, it just goes on and on, uh, on, on, on addressing the people there. So anyway, so but now verse, verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So, again, in Mount Sinai's mount, God told Moses, don't let anybody come near this mount. Only you, Moses, and and Joshua, all right? And Joshua only came up so far, all right? Only you and Joshua can come up. Everybody else has to stay away. But here what we have is we have an invitation to come up to the Mount Zion, to the, to the city of the living God, it says there, and to partake of all of the blessings that God has for us because he welcomes us as children, gods, uh, as sons and daughters of God there. And so go back there again and, and let's look at that. Sinai was, as you see in your notes there, was tangible, it was visible, but it was frightening. Zion, Mount Zion, is invisible. It's in the heavenlies, but it's inviting and it's welcoming and because he wants us to, be, to find ourselves by faith in this holy city. When he says, you have come, according to scholars, and I'm not expert on that, but according to scholars, the Greek says this, you have come indeed, and you can stay in the presence of the Lord in this city. It's not like you're going to come, but you have come to this mountain. That invisible mountain with the assembly of angels and the, first fruit, uh, the firstborn and the, the judge and the spirits of the just men made perfect, all of those things are there with you now. You can have, you can partake of the blessings of this heavenly Mount Zion right here where we are tonight seated, all right? That's, uh, so it's, it's, it's a invisible reality. It's a place which believers can come to, as I say there, at a point in time in the past, but are continuing to experience it at present. It's a place where God meets with man in covenant love and is able to effect his ultimate plan for him and the world through the church. Mount Zion is again the place where David set up his tabernacle. Now you remember the story that David took the Ark of the Covenant from the house of Obed-Edom? Well, from one place, then to Obed-Edom's, did it wrong, had to stay there for three months. Then he brought it back from Obed-Edom into Jerusalem, and he, set, and he put it in a tent. And then he ordained 24-7 worship at this, right? And, 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 and so the, because he knew that the presence of the Lord was right there in his natural Jerusalem, but it was like bringing the heavenly Jerusalem there as well in the presence of God. And there was worship there, and therefore the presence of God allowed for David to understand God's will and to effect God's will in the earth. Uh, because the whole point of the Jews was to be a witness of Jesus, excuse me, of God to the whole world and that people would know that God resided with the Jews at that place. It was a place of perpetual worship and practice. And from Mount Zion came forth, according to Psalm 110, the rod of God's uh, law. Excuse me, the, the, God, the rod of God's strength. This is from Psalm 110. I like to read that. Again, if you're there, it's a wonderful psalm where it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. 
the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And so this becomes a picture on earth of the heavenly Mount Zion in miniature. So David could say, because I have the presence of God here in this tent and worship going on, he's being glorified, he's being enthroned on the worship of Israel. The rod of God's strength can extend from this Jerusalem, ruling in the midst of the enemies. And then it says, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. It's just saying there will be continual refreshment coming from the presence of God there. Um, it says, for out of Zion, this is Isaiah 2, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation and neither shall they learn war anymore. In other words, peace will be established when God is truly enthroned on the praises of his people. And God's people are united in desire for that kingdom and that heavenly mountain to be established. Because it does say in the Revelation that I saw the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven to the earth. And so everybody wants to go to heaven, but eventually heaven's coming back to earth. All right? Sorry. <laughs> that's the way you can argue with the word, right? the book of Revelation. But that's what's going to happen. Heaven and earth are going to be conjoined. What do we say? Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Where? On earth, just as it is in heaven. Okay, but it's, but it's coming. So this heavenly Jerusalem is, you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city. This, uh, in Galatians uh, 4, 26, 27, Paul says, this city is the city of freedom. It's the mother of us all. It nourishes us. It nurses us with, what it, with it, what it has in it, all the things described there. Um, it's a continuing city, a lasting city, according to Hebrews 13. Yeah, it's a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. It is a city, of, and um, I know where time's running out here, but the, it's a city in the Greek sense. The Greeks call their, their, their cities polis, singular, a polis. A polis we get the word police and so on there. Apollos was the city, but to the Greek, it wasn't, you know, I just think of a city, if, if the city father said to me, Elliot, you can't live in San Diego anymore, I'd just go to Santee or Oceanside or something. It was a big deal, all right? But to the Greek, you and your city were one. To leave the city was to die, in a sense. Remember, Socrates refused to leave. He, he preferred to die there. The city was your identity. You grew up there, all, you, you were involved in politics. Remember the democracy, they all voted and so on. You and that city were one, and, and, and to leave it was like tearing your arm out or something like that. You, and to be exiled was a fate worse than death, so to speak. The city, we, it's hard for us to conceive of this, but the Greeks, to, to the Greeks, your identity was your city. It was the same sort of idea. This is the heavenly polis. This is where the presence of God dwells. It's something that you identify with and he, and he identifies with you in it. And it's, it's not complete without you and you're not complete without it. Okay, so this is what he's talking about there. As the Greeks understood the term, that's what we're talking about here. It has, uh, because of time, I'll just run through these other uh, aspects of this city. It's a place of the innumerable company of angels. They're singing and praising God. And uh, this is, uh, again, innumerable is actually, well, let's listen to Revelation 5.11. This is how heaven is, okay? I beheld, said, this is John, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was, are you ready for this number? 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. These are the angels that are, that are in the city, and, it says, and, this, and they're, then they're crying out, worthy is the lamb that was slain. That's the kind of life. And I've talked about, when I taught about the Lord's Prayer, I had an experience many years ago. Uh, I was praying the Lord's Prayer, and I came to the line, says, as your kingdom come and your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, and he stopped me. I just, he just jolted me, he said, stop. 
I said, well, what's going on? I'm, I'm praying, Lord, can't you see I'm praying? I mean, but it was, and, he, and he said to me, and I just, just felt this deep within, he says, how is my will done in heaven that you want it repeated on earth? And, you know, and I was thinking, well, you just tell angels what to do, I guess, and that's, you know, but no, it's not that at all. Because God is there in all of his wisdom and glory. There's no, there's no confusion at all. People, when God speaks and when he says something, he wants a, something done, his will to be done, it's glorious. People just are awed by it. <laughs> it's just a place of joy and, and rejoicing. And ten thousands times ten thousands are crying out with, with wonder at what God's will is. And then you say, I want thy kingdom to come and thy will to be done just as it's done in heaven on the earth. In other words, we want to build, a, have a people, have a church where we're just so in awe of what God is saying and moving and doing that we're like that at those 10,000s times 10,000s rejoicing in heaven. That's the kind of city that we're talking about here. Okay. So, uh, so the, the great rejoicing. God is the judge of all things here. And, and we say, oh, I don't like that idea of judge. But it's interesting. He's called God is, is a king. He's a father. He's a, 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 a savior. He's, a, as I say, all these other titles, but they chose the word judge to be the, the title that's given to God in this holy city. Well, actually, the Jews rejoiced in God coming to judge the earth, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth and the peoples with equity. Because if you judge the wicked, what happens? You have peace, right? And, and if we have been covered in the blood of the Lamb, we're forgiven of our sins. When we come before the throne, we don't have to be judged or condemned. But, he, but we know that we ache for how people are hurt by other people and situations on earth. But God, the judge, will, will judge the wicked, and then the land, the earth, will be filled with the peace of God. Uh, so we can come before him and, uh, and not have to, not have to fe fear a condemnation there. Nevertheless, for the wicked, he is the judge, and he will come, and that's what we have to desire that the gospel go into all the world and be preached to every creature. He is the judge also in the sense, and I'll finish with this, except for just reading the others here. He's a judge who has to be equitable. He has to meet out justice. Is that right? He has to do it if he's, because there's no, nothing higher than God. And if, and, if, and if there's a law breaking or there's hurt or harm, whatever, he has to judge that. Our defense is that because of Jesus is dying on the cross, he can forgive us. We don't have to be condemned. But for those who, are, uh, who do not recognize this, what Jesus did for them, true, perfect, total justice has to be meted out. In the previous classes, I've given, the, I've given an example there. I said if I, if I developed a computer hack and it affected a million computers and each person needed to pay $100 to get it fixed or lost $100 in, uh, in income or something like that, if I was a perfect judge and this person comes before me, he hasn't been saved, I'm just a perfect judge. All right? I'm not emotional, I'm not kind, mean, or anything. I'm just a perfect judge. I'd say, well, just on the financial basis, I'd say, well, Mr. Jones, you owe $100 million. Okay. How, how would you like to pay? By check or by cash? Okay. What, what's Mr. Jones going to do? Yeah. There's nothing. He has to pay in the coin of the afterlife, which is his soul, which is a very great tragedy. Okay. And even if I said, well, Mr. Jones, I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm not usually merciful, but I'm going to let you pay it off $100 an hour of community service. That'll be a million hours, please. Okay. I don't have a, I don't have a million hours. That's, oh, that's right. Well, I'll have to pay it the other way. You see what I'm trying to say? And that's only one sin. That's only one bad thing that a guy did. Imagine your whole life filled with all of your sins, and the judge is saying, remember 14, um, Romans 14.10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? Imagine that having to give an explanation, not only to have it spoken to you by the prosecutor, but to, but to, to have to defend yourself. Unless you have, can claim the blood of Jesus, what are you going to say? Yeah. All right. It's also the, the city of the spirits of just men made perfect. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And of the sprinkled blood, which speaks better things than the blood of Abel. And we'll close. That's the, that's the last description of the city there. 
and it ends with the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. And, and, that, and I think about it. Thomas Jefferson once said, I tremble when I think that God is a God of justice. Imagine if, remember it says in Genesis, he who takes man's life by man shall his life be taken. There has been accounting for all innocent blood shed. What if, every, what if this country, the United States, has to pay a price for the blood of all the abortions and everything that have taken place, all the innocent blood that's been shed? The only thing that can save the United States on that basis, if you don't mind me getting political, is the blood of Jesus Christ, which speaks better things than the blood and the, that cries out for vengeance or for a redress there. We have to ask that this, Lord, this country would indeed enter into a revival and a return to him and a crying out for mercy in times of judgment. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together over the book of Hebrews. May the words of these the names that we looked at and the, the truths of this book settle deeply into our heart that we may walk with you in white and purity of, of desire and zeal for you and your, the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.